Good morning. It's an honor and I really feel blessed and grateful to be here, be here with you and to have this amazing subject of social good and um, data science blended together and honestly what we really want with these four people here is to bring the audience to the table so we want questions and it's not going to be about us only it's going to be about you as well so the first thing first things first Danielle I would like to ask you to introduce yourself first just okay. a little bit and short short bio please Paul Louise and stage is yours. Okay, so my name is Daniel Truss. I'm Dean at the Nova School of Business Economics, which used to be on the big yellow building that you see when you get out, and whereas this year, which has this year moved to Krakavelos. <laughs> and we are a school of economics and of finance and management, but of course also a school of data and a school of the future. And the future is about how data brings value to the world, how data brings value to companies, how data brings value to the economy, so we're also a school of data because everything is going to be about data. And looking forward for this discussion. Wonderful. Uh, my name is Louise Lambert. I know nothing about data, but I know a lot about happiness. Uh, so my area of expertise is positive psychology. I teach at university. I also do a lot of research. I'm also the editor of the Middle East Journal of Positive Psychology. So I'm going to hopefully inspire you a little bit to think about how do we introduce questions of well-being, happiness as a social good, and what can we start looking for in terms of um, big data, how can we help each other create a happier society? Good morning. Um, bon dia in Sao Paulo. I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I uh, represent Data Science for Social Good Europe. I'm one of its co-founders. Um, I spent a, a couple of important periods of my life in Portugal, so I'm very happy to be here uh, again. Say uh, where? Say where, Paul? Where in Portugal? <laughs> in Lisbon? No. Oh, and in Cascais as well, uh, in various parts of beautiful uh, Portugal. Um, so I'll be tell, talking a little bit more about what data science for social good uh, Europe is, what we do there, and uh, very much look forward to, uh, to getting your questions and engagement on that. Very good. My name is Carolina. Um, I'm the co-founder of Sapana. I'm, I'm not a social good, uh, I'm not a, a data science girl, I'm a social good girl. I'm, I'm completely uh, passionate about humankind, sustainability, and the subject of purpose economy. And I think this subject is all about that. So, uh, Louise, can I ask you to start this yeah. panel, please, with your amazing subject of happiness? I always get worried when people say amazing subject. <laughs> <laughs> pressure, no pressure. I have a lot to, yeah, no pressure at all. <laughs> <laughs> And I put the requisite exclamation marks, which is what everybody wants to see when we talk about <laughs> happiness. Um, so today, like I said, my background is not uh, data science. It's not even data. I don't even do my own statistics. Um, but I am interested in questions of happiness, what makes life worthwhile, um, what makes life fun, what makes life pleasant. Um, and right now I'm working in the UAE. I've been there for nine years. And I'm also introducing questions of culture because we know that happiness is not the same everywhere we go. So I'm sort of examining um, what that looks like in different places. So what I wanted to start with today, I'm assuming this is the clicker, yay, is what is happiness? Because um, I think there's a lot of confusion around that. And there are two types of happiness. So most of us will be very familiar with the first. It's what, what we call hedonic happiness. So this is happiness in the moment. So a good bottle of Turiga Nacional, uh, watching football, winning football, even better. So these are the things that bring us instant gratification, right here, right now, in the moment. So these are things that feel pleasant. It also involves a lot of different positive emotions. Uh, inspiration, curiosity, love, gratitude. Uh, and these are things that are also fairly easy to capture. Uh, if we're looking at people's di digital traces on Twitter, Facebook, and whatnot. There's another type of happiness that is much harder to grasp. And this is the type of happiness that we often forget, but this is the type of happiness that actually contributes the most to making life um, meaningful and actually feeling as though it matters. So this is also the type of happiness that feels wrong. So for instance, 
getting up on a Friday morning to come to a conference. <laughs> You're sitting here learning, taking notes, thinking, gee, I'm maybe not having that much fun. Coffee's good, so are the donuts, but that's a form of eudaimonic happiness, learning. Um, doing something very diff difficult, so maybe running a marathon, scaling a mountain, uh, while you are doing it, it doesn't feel good at all. Maybe you're getting a blister, you've got cramps, tear a muscle, it's freezing, it's hot. But after you do it, you feel a tremendous sense of triumph, human achievement. You realize the uh, depths and the heights that you're able to reach. And this is what we call eudaimonic happiness. Now this type is much more difficult to capture on people's digital traces. Um, and so that's something that uh, I know is currently being looked at in the research. How do we capture that? So at the moment, how do we measure happiness? So just as an aside, in positive psychology, we never use the word happiness. It actually has no definition. But we use it when we're having conversations like this because it's the word that people know. But within the field of psychology, we might use life satisfaction, subjective well-being, and there's a number of different proxies for happiness, um, which will include states of flow, so when we're highly absorbed in something we're doing, typically we see this in sports, um, different positive emotions, engagement, so engagement at work would be an example, uh, meaning, you have meaning in life. Is there a reason why you get up in the morning and do what you do? So this would also have to do with values. Um, flourishing, but we can also measure happiness uh, behaviorally as well, simply by looking at what people do, how many minutes they spend in particular activities. So the assumption here is that if you're going to spend 48 minutes playing basketball, I would think that that's something you like to do. Okay? Um, generally, we're not forced into doing these things, or we soon give up and it stops. We can also measure happiness through behaviors, so smiling behavior. Although, this is a very good example of where culture comes in. So North Americans in particular are very expressive. We always like to show how happy we are. But if you go to a place like Iran, and if you smile, they think you're stupid. Okay? It's a sign of immaturity. So people generally don't smile. It's not because they're not happy, but how they express that will look very different. So sometimes these indicators, we can use them in some places, but they're maybe less good in other places. We can also use what we call informant responses. Simply asking your friends, hey, is Paolo happy? Paolo might think he's happy, okay? And maybe he wants to be happy, but maybe you've noticed for the past two months, Paolo is not happy. Paolo is a little bit miserable, okay? And so sometimes what people have to say about their friends and family can be more accurate than what the individual has to say. That's another way we might measure it as well. Uh, lots of different health indicators. Um, again, maybe not quite uh, an accurate measure for happiness, but certainly a proxy of well-being. So an example of that would be how quickly you heal from a wound. Um, however, we know that smokers heal uh, not as fast as non-smokers. So again, we can't just use one indicator, but we need to use a whole bunch. One of the things that we're looking at um, recently is people's digital traces. How many likes? How much time do you spend <coughs> scrolling or reading different posts? Do you comment? What is the quality of those comments? Do you have positive things to say or do you say everything's stupid? Um, so these are some uh, current ways that we have of measuring happiness. So in preparation for this um, conference, I went through um, many different articles, kind of like the guy from Aegis who's reading all the art stuff in the past couple of weeks, I did the same. Um, and I came across um, a couple of studies that I think are I interesting, but simply to illustrate how big data can be useful um, for us in psychology, but also the world over. Um, and one of those ways is looking at the detection and prediction of mental illnesses. Um, so this one study, 2017, just recently. Um, so what they asked is they found a group of participants um, through clinics, hospitals, who had been diagnosed with um, post-traumatic stress disorder and depression and said, can you give us access to your Twitter feed? And so, again, I'm not into, I don't know the proper terms, but um, plug the cell into some kind of algorithm and they wanted to see, is it possible to detect who has PTSD much earlier than we currently do. So currently, it takes 19 months to detect whether somebody has PTSD or not. So from the, from the time where they first start showing symptoms all the way to the point of diagnosis, 19 months. 
Now, if you think about what happens in 19 months uh, in terms of the costs, so the cost to relationships, people will be taking time off of work, people will be going to their doctors for various aches and pains that are not really related to anything. Um, so the costs really add up. Um, they also wanted to look at, similarly, for people with depression. So can we predict who is going to have depression based on their Twitter feeds? And what they found is that people who are depressed um, are, tend to be a lot more wordy um, on their Twitter feed. They're actually more active, usually from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. when the rest of us are sleeping. Um, and they use words like shit, murder, die, pretty grim. Um, and happier people, and this coincides with other research that we know about happier people, have a lot less to say. They tend to be a lot less wordy, but they post more pictures. Um, and everything beach and love and icons and exclamation marks. Um, and so what did they find? That um, predictions, uh, or sorry, detection went from 19 months, but using an actual algorithm uh, based on people's Twitter feeds, it dropped to six months. That's a huge difference. So again, think about what that means in terms of cost savings for healthcare, employment, whatnot. Um, depression, uh, this is where they use prediction, and algorithms were able to predict up to 70%. Actually pretty good. Not great, but if you consider the average doctor, isn't that good either. Uh, and the prediction rates were um, pretty similar. Another thing that we're finding with big data is that it's forcing us to challenge what we think we know. So psychologists, and I'm a psychologist, so I can say this, um, we tend to think we know everything. Right? We're experts, we can tell you all about how to you know, screw up your marriage and mess up your kids, and we know all this stuff. But sometimes um, some of the new research that's coming out of uh, using big data is really asking us to step back and go, oh, maybe we were wrong on a couple of things. So this particular study illustrated that. So they wanted to see, um, can we predict who is going to become a binge drinker? So using, um, can we predict at 14 years of age, <clears throat> sorry, who's going to become a binge drinker by the time they are 16? Now typically, and, and you probably will have the same hypotheses, you think of who's going to become a binge drinker, it might be the kid who's maybe truant, skipping school, not doing very well in school, maybe having <clears throat> sorry, family problems, not getting along with mom, dad, uh, whatnot. And so using machine learning, taking an unsupervised approach with a number of different variables, the best predictor turned out to be the kids who are most conscientious. Well, so this is really asking us to reconsider what we think we know. So as psychologists, but I'm assuming many scientists do this, we jump right away to the question why, and maybe we should be backing up and thinking, have we really answered what yet? And um, maybe we haven't quite gotten there, and we don't think, or we don't know everything we know. Um, just another example of accuracy. So this study was done in Turkey, again, using Twitter feeds. Uh, these researchers wanted to see, um, can we compare Twitter feeds to the Turkish Statistical Institute? Um, they run a survey, uh, I think it's every quarter, asking the very same subjective well-being questions. And it turns out that the, um, so what we can find on Twitter is virtually identical to what is picked up by the survey. The difference with the survey, though, is by the time it gets published, it's about two or three months old. So not very useful, serves absolutely no purpose, and we can find it just by using Twitter, um, which is a lot easier. So what we're finding, and as has been uh, sort of du duplicated in many of the talks so far, that big data can help us predict, can help us detect, um, and it is also quite accurate. Now you might be thinking, okay, so who really cares about happiness? Governments sure do, and they should. So um, just doing some research literature for uh, another research project I'm working on, what we find is that governments should be paying attention a lot more to happiness because it might have helped us predict things like the Arab Spring. So every year uh, and every quarter, Gallup, for instance, asks people around the world, virtually every single country, um, including um, regions that aren't considered countries, or Palestine even, um, how happy are you? So it's not quite a simple question like that, but we use what's called a cantor ladder, or different subjective well-being measures. And we have all this data, we just don't take it seriously. 
because what is the data we tend to look at are objective things. GDP, crime, education, <coughs> statistics. But what we should be looking at is subjective data. How do people actually feel about their lives? So what these researchers found is that had we bothered to look, that data had been there the whole time. In the years leading up to the Arab Spring, um, and other events like this, so the, um, what do they call the Euro Maiden Revolution in uh, the Ukraine, Brexit vote as well, had we bothered to look, we would have found that the subjective well-being measures had been dropping steadily to pretty low critical points, despite the fact that levels of GDP had been climbing. So we actually call this the unhappy development paradox. Governments focus on the wrong thing. So they're looking for objective measures, but if you don't know how people feel about their lives, those are virtually useless. And at the end of the day, how you feel about your own opportunities and what is ahead means a lot more than whether the GDP has climbed or not, because it may have climbed for your neighbor down the road, but for you not. Um, so we need to be paying a lot more attention to emotions and how people actually feel. So is happiness uh, even worthwhile? Well, again, a lot of national and international comparative data um, tells us that it is. So happiness is actually a social good that we can leverage. So nations can actually leverage positive emotions, objective well-being for uh, a number of benefits to increase uh, innovation, uh, competitiveness, um, other types of growth. So what are some of these benefits? I won't read them to you here, but when we look at happiness, again, we are combining the hedonic happiness and eudaimonic happiness. So both types uh, are uh, important and worthwhile. And again, these really reflect the type of societies we all want to live in. So again, looking at what governments do, can do, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about individuals in a moment, but there are some governments that are getting pretty clever with this. So we're actually mapping happiness. So typically we map traffic circulation, um, crime, you know, where are people most educated. Again, those are important to know, but it's also important to know where are people happy. And so a number of countries have developed happy maps. So you can actually look at a map of a city and see where people score highest on subjective well-being. Uh, chatty maps, so where do, where, where do people uh, more likely to talk to their neighbors? Right? Where uh, do people actually get on the street and say, good morning, or just ignore you and drive away? Uh, smelly maps, so smelly can be where do they not take out the garbage, but also smelly maps um, where there are the best parks or the best cuisine. Uh, superhero maps. So here we've done studies looking at where are people most likely to pick up a wallet and actually return it to somebody. So we use this as a proxy, and this is a study that's been done worldwide. It's a proxy for pro-social behavior, uh, and it tends to correlate pretty well with crime rates also. So what's the use of these maps? Uh, oh, there's also, this one is Australia, uh, where, uh, which neighborhoods do people smile more? Okay. So they kind of seem silly on the surface, maybe a little gimmicky, good PR, and, and they can be that, but they are also, um, they also give us good information. They also allow people to plan and make decisions. So if you're looking to move somewhere, it's not enough just to know which neighborhood has the lowest amount of crime, but where are people gonna be nicest to me? Where am I gonna integrate the easiest? So there's a number of different things that this can help us with. Um, but probably one of the biggest benefits of doing this is that people realize I have a role to play. So if you see that your neighborhood scores very low on a smile map, that means you are not smiling enough. So this can actually be a tool to boost social engagement um, or civic engagement. We can even use this in the workplace. So which department smiles the most? Or which department is a superhero and is more helpful? So if you're in a department of three people, that's you, okay? So this can be, uh, help people take responsibility for their own happiness as well. So how do governments uh, benefit when happiness matters? So again, I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but again, um, making better uh, decisions, better predictions, 
Um, so, you know, for instance, if we know a particular neighborhood has a 10%, uh, they score 10% higher in subjective well-being than another neighborhood, um, that might help us decide where we're going to place a refugee resettlement center. Um, so we want people to integrate and be welcome in society, but we won't put them maybe in a neighborhood that already has quite low subjective well-being. It's going to help us um, make decisions um, and, you, and actually leverage positive emotions towards uh, building greater social good. Um, but it can also help individuals as well. So I forgot to bring my phone up here anyway, my little prop, but just pretend you, you all have phones anyway. Um, how, how can this help individuals? So imagine you're sitting at Starbucks, you're feeling a little bit low, and you're just kind of scrolling your phone. Um, and we know that people who are feeling low scroll faster. You're not actually reading anything. <laughs> just thinking, right, scroll, 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 scroll. Um, and as you're doing that, maybe the phone can actually use facial recognition, can actually detect what emotions you're feeling. Uh, maybe there can be something that can detect the temperature of your hand, although that doesn't work if you're in Dubai and it's 47 degrees. Um, but anyway, depending on where you live, right? But there's a number of indicators. Um, and plus, so using AI, again, big data, we already know what you like, we already know your preferences, we already know your social networks, we already know um, maybe different health conditions, health status, um, your usual activity levels, personality. We already know all of this. So maybe a little prompt can come up and say, hey, you know, there's a 12th Street Recreation Center. They're actually looking for volunteers tonight at 7 p.m. Can we tell them you're coming? So, so there's not much for you to do there other than just to say yes or no. But can we sort of engineer, can we nudge people to greater happiness based on what we know and will eventually know. Just some thoughts. So I just want to tell you briefly about two research studies that I'm working on right now. Um, one, I have all my collaborators. The second one, I don't. So I'm open and I'm hoping the uh, Aegis guy is here, just by, just uh, you know, in case. If not, it's okay. You can all tell them that I talked about them. Um, all right, so one of my uh, studies I'm looking at right now um, so in Dubai, we have, well, in the UAE, we have an Emirates ID card. And I don't have it because I'm frantically panicking. I'm hoping it's in the hotel room because I need it to get back in the country. But this little card, we use it for everything. So it's getting in and out of the country. We don't even use passports. Um, there's a chip on there, and it records everything. So your rental contract, they know where you live. They know how much you pay. Uh, you want to open up a library account. It's on that card. You want to copy a key. It's on that card. Uh, your electricity bills. Um, loan information, you bought a car, uh, everything is on this card. And it helps in a way to be in a country where individual privacy rights are much more easily <laughs> gone around. But so given that we know all this information, um, this is kind of big thinking. So our study is going to be in two phases. So the first phase, we want to see um, who lives in Dubai. Um, and looking at these things, so personality variables, what values are important to them? So we're using the Swartz uh, value scale. So here we're trying to determine are people more traditionalist? Um, they're more, maybe religion is more important to them. Maybe money is more important to them. So we're trying to build profiles about who's there. Um, and a number of other questions. And then we're trying to see, can we increase uh, or meet city KPIs? So things like increasing volunteering, decreasing littering, um, boosting health behaviors, uh, decreasing water use. We don't have a lot of water. People use it like for everything. Um, decreasing car accidents. If you've been to Dubai, you know it's pretty important. People drive very fast. Um, so our ultimate goal is meeting city KPIs, but also can we engineer a happier city? Because we meet all these KPIs, the thought is, you know, if you're not getting in a car accident or being stressed out in traffic every day, that might be Once we have all this, perhaps if we just imagine you're driving through a toll booth. Uh, maybe instead of advertising, as is there at the moment, it could be a message simply saying, hey, Paolo, Maria's at home waiting for you. Slow down. Oh, cool. Okay. Because, of course, that would be tagged to your car registration, and we already know all this information about it. Maybe if we know that Muhammad is also very religious, we can send him a pop-up text 
because the blood donation needs greater volunteers um, or greater donations, we can just make a quick comment about uh, you know 20 percent or 10 percent of people in Dubai uh, rely on blood donation services. Five of these are in your neighborhood. Can we count on you to go to blood donation? And I mean another way we use it. We know somebody is also pretty um, worried about social comparisons. Um, you know, for electricity bills. Um, hey, you're using like 30 percent more than all your neighbors. What's going on? So if we can influence some of that behavior, that's something that would be comfortable. Last one, I'm getting the looks. <laughs> um, is we're looking at uh, a happiness certification uh, project. So here we're trying to develop a digital platform of how can we have the biggest impact in um, not just in organizations, but if you know anything about UAE, we have a Minister of Happiness now. So this is a big thing they're taking seriously. And the idea is can organizations boost well-being through their interactions with employees, through consumers, but also through the actual products that they make. And so we'll be looking for partners to try and gather some of that information uh, and see where we get. So I will stop there. Uh, other points will come up uh, at a later date and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Louisa. Um, let's see if this works. This is the clicker. Right? Yeah. So good morning again. Um, so um, what I'm going to be talking to you about uh, right now in about 15 minutes is what is data science for social good? Because in, uh, in my world, in our world, uh, there are many ways to interpret that. But we, for us, it's, uh, it's got an organization, a movement, uh, and, and a mission. Um, and there's three main components to um, what I'm calling data science for social good today. Uh, but of course, maybe you have more. But for us, it means education, it means incubation, and community. And I'm going to give you some examples about what each of those uh, mean to us. The first one, if you think about education, for us, we, we talk about how we enable data scientists to be able to work on the problems that really matter. Actually, can I get a hands of who considers themselves to be a data scientist in the audience? Just for me to get a sense. It's bright light in my eyes, but I can see some hands. OK. Looks like the minority. Very few. Probably representative of what the actual population globally uh, considers themselves to be data scientists. But what we try to do is, one, help people that have the foundations of data science uh, to spend their time working on problems that we, that we think are, that, that matter. Uh, the second thing is incubation. I'll talk about that a little bit more. But what we think there is that by teaching and, and doing education on data science, uh, in particular in the area of social good, we also want to demonstrate through prototypes, by building tools, by launching products, what it actually, uh, what it actually takes to go from data science to impact in, in terms of social good. And then the third piece is community. Um, so over the, the, the past couple of years, data science for social good, as I'm talking about, is about six years old now. Um, we've built up a community. Uh, we've built up a community of people that, are, that care about doing social good, that want to use their skills or want to learn about uh, becoming data scientists. And uh, we, we want to nurture that community, and that's something we do actively and want to, want to keep building on uh, a little bit more. So let's talk about education for a second. I, I have a short video. Uh, this is uh, from when Data Science for Social Good started, to give you a sense of how we uh, started what we call the Data Science for Social Good Summer Fellowship. for Social Good Fellowship is really to take data scientists and train them to work on problems, to solve problems that actually matter. And what I mean by that is people who have computer science and statistics and economics and policy and analytical skills, giving them an environment where they learn how to not only solve real problems, but focus on problems that have social impact in areas such as education and energy and healthcare and transportation and public safety. So what we wanted to do was build this hybrid person who has all these different skills but also understands how to take real problems, communicate with people about those problems, solve them, and then help figure out a way to transfer and, and, and 
transition those solutions into the real world to the partner organizations. I saw this advertisement for the for fellowship and it said data science and social good and I thought to myself, wow, that's, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Something that has all the neat data, technology, those interesting problems, those fun problems, those hard problems, um, but problems in the area of social good, something that is able to improve people's lives. I heard about the program through my advisor. Uh, it really pulled me in since the beginning just because I understand the amount of good that you can do with a little bit of data. The reason that we're doing this program with Argonne and the University of Chicago, the reason that this is the right place to do this, so I'm going to stop it there because uh, now it talks about the old form of data science for social good. Uh, you saw University of Chicago, as you uh, might know, the Summer Fellowship uh, has since then uh, got sort of uh, been cloned uh, here at Nova with some of the, the support of, uh, of, of Danielle of, of late. I don't know if he's still here, who are the torchbearers of data science for social good here in Portugal. And what we in intend to do and what we're doing uh, you know, on a yearly basis through the Summer Fellowship is really um, bringing people, uh, data scientists, together with organizations that have a social uh, good uh, challenge and, and, uh, uh, and basically spend three months together for, uh, for full time, 12 weeks, uh, trying to solve problems that matter. And as you can imagine, as maybe <clears throat> you can also pick up by the, the, the full room here, this is a topic that people care about. So we get a lot of applications every year. Um, we counted about 4,300 over the past six years or so uh, from all parts of the world, from all different disciplines uh, that are interested in doing this kind of work. And um, if you then uh, think about why do these people apply for data science or social good? Why are you guys here? Why do I care about this? Um, I think at least the words of the fellowship and I agree with uh, the fellows and I agree with many of them is that people want to take the skills that they have and uh, apply them to a real problem. Uh, they want to do actionable data science. They don't want, they want to move from uh, maybe just uh, data munging to uh, providing some insights uh, that somebody on the other side can act on. Um, they want to solve a problem that a real person cares about. And these are things that, that the fellows tell us when they come to data science for Social Good Summer Fellowship that they want to spend time on. So the formula, I won't spend too much time on this. We have three months full time uh, in basically three phases with the fellows uh, that we uh, select from the pool of applicants. Uh, that we then train by doing. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, through the support of, uh, of NOVA, uh, we basically uh, uh, came onto fertile ground here uh, in, uh, in Lisbon and Cascais to set up the, the program. And it's still actively uh, uh, running very successfully. Another we've, we just closed the program a couple of weeks ago. Um, and if you look at the partners we've worked with, um, there's, there's, there's a whole range. I think I, I forgot the, the actual comment. It's over 60 by now. Uh, organizations from all over the world that do social good in their day to day. And they come to us and we work with them, they give us data. Um, some examples that you might recognize is uh, José de Melo Saúd, uh, a Portuguese example. We have uh, IEF, uh, Instituto de Emprego e Formação Profissional. Um, and there's lots of other ones, right? So uh, organizations that care about education, organizations that care about uh, poverty, organizations that care about the environment. Um, and so over the years, we've, we've actually gotten quite a, a lot of experience of working on different types of problems in different parts of government um, uh, and how to apply data science uh, in a social good context. So um, I'll quickly highlight two examples just to give you an idea what, what we do and what comes out of it. When I, also when I talk about incubation and, and building a prototype. One of them here is the city of Cincinnati. Uh, for those of you that don't know Cincinnati uh, and the problem that Cincinnati deals with, it's very similar that some other cities in the U.S. deal with. Uh, like Detroit, where you basically have urban decay because parts of the city, um, people are leaving, the windows are, are, are broken, and once you get sort of a bad uh, neighborhood, uh, you very quickly can trigger a snowball effect. And if you don't spot when blocks like this start to develop on time, you can basically destroy a lot of uh, people's lives because they have to move out and you get the city to look like this. So what we did um, is we looked at the map of uh, the city of Cincinnati. Uh, we looked at their building uh, code violations data uh, and tried to see whether we could predict which homes were uh, seeing building code violations, which is the things that I just mentioned. So it's maybe tall grass, somebody has a broken window, a tree fell onto the roof, uh, things like that. And you can see that you know, it's, it's very neighborhood dependent, right? Because these things are, are correlated uh, geographically or geospatially. And uh, what we ended up building with them over the summer is a prototype of a tool 
that they could use to identify where the highest risk buildings in the city were, so their team of about 50 uh, city officials could go to those buildings proactively and said, hey, your grass is growing a little taller than it should be, you haven't done your maintenance, uh, you know, we have funds in the city, can we help you make sure that you have enough money or if whatever reason the, the people weren't fixing up the homes to make sure that the neighborhood is maintained uh, to its standard. So this is one of those tools that, uh, that they then, uh, uh, we, we prototyped and they, they tested uh, in the field. Uh, another example is completely different. This was one that we did here last year uh, in Portugal. Um, this was a, about the problem of illegal fishing. So this is actually one of the biggest environmental, uh, let's say, uh, topics and, 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 and risks that we face today is the depletion of our oceans. Uh, unfortunately, because it's very far away from many people and uh, it's very hard to get data on this, we don't really know, or people don't have it on the forefront, but it's really, really bad. If you look at the species of tuna, how they've declined over the last 50 years, it's about 90 to 95% by various estimates. So it's a really, really big problem. And so we teamed up with the World Economic Forum and, and various satellite data providers uh, to basically look at uh, can we do something about spotting illegal fishing because that's one of the main drivers of this over overfishing. So if you look at this map, this is basically 140 million data points of uh, ships moving over the ocean in the period of about a year. And this is all ships, so you'll see the highways of the sea. By the way, we didn't uh, 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 draw in the, uh, the contours of the continents, right? This is just a virtue of the data of the shipping. Obviously, you won't see ships moving into uh, Europe or Africa unless there's rivers but we didn't draw those edges that's all based on ships and then what I do, what I'll do and just look at the image I'm gonna only highlight the fishing vessels okay so this is a filter of the fishing vessels we go back one time all the highways and then fishing ves vessels and what's important to notice here is that you'll see a couple of white spots in the middle of the ocean these are marine protected areas they're sort of on the, on the west side there, and you'll also see them around the border of Australia, for example. It's very, very white, and then it has very dense areas there. I'm going to flip back one more time. You see Australia there. They have this, I think, a, I don't remember the exact distance, about 100 or 200 kilometers off their coast where nobody's allowed to fish. So you can see that show up on this map. So we use this data to figure out where are these fishing vessels moving, uh, and can we predict where illegal fishing happens. So we looked at satellite data. We were able to identify some, some fishing vessels uh, as you can see here, uh, you identify the, the, the ship itself from space and you know what its location was, you know what its carrying uh, sign was, what their purpose was. And then uh, we did this on, uh, on many, many of those images that the satellite providers uh, showed us. And you can see here various ships that we were able to uh, filter out of uh, hundreds of thousands of images. And then what we did is we looked at the traces of those ships to try and see if there's strange behavior. The, the blue line is a vessel that uh, is basically transporting. It's a transportation vessel, cargo vessel, whatever. It goes straight to the destination. A fishing vessel is one of those green ones. So we can, by looking at the variation in its heading, probably predict when a, fi when a vessel is fishing. So there are various indicators of vessels that tell us when they are potentially behaving in, uh, in, in risky, we call it risky ways. So you can never prove necessarily that they're doing illegal fishing, but you can get an indicator, almost like a risk score. So we combined those various data points and then uh, created a ranked list of um, what those uh, ships uh, were doing uh, according to whether they were moving in marine protected areas, if they had a call sign that said fishing, whether they were fishing back and forth at lower or going back and forth on, on lower speeds, uh, whether they were calling into specific ports that we knew were associated with this kind of behavior. And you can basically create a list that somebody could then use uh, to go out and enforce uh, where illegal fishing should uh, not be taking place. This is another example of where when we talk about incubation and we talk about building prototypes, this is something that could typically come out of our educational summer fellowship that then our partners can take and, uh, and test in the field. And um, what we have as a, uh, as a core uh, values thing in, in data science for social good is that the code and the algorithms and, and the things that we build in general uh, are open and available. So if you go to our GitHub, um, we have a GitHub for, uh, well, actually, there's various GitHubs. This is one of them, uh, which is an online repository for those of you that are not familiar with GitHub, where you can make code available for others to look at, to download, to, uh, to replicate, or whatever. With the idea, of course, that if there is another city like Cincinnati um, that wants to look at its the neighborhoods, they can download the, the code and look at that. Um, so that's one of the things we do. We try to use tools that are open source, that are freely available, so that the, the governments don't need to go to 
uh, you know, a commercial software provider to buy a license before they can even look at any of this stuff to make it as easy as possible to adopt some of these practices. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to touch upon is the community. So this is a picture from, uh, from the fellowship uh, um, here in Portugal. And these are the fellows that we had uh, last year. And they form part of a much larger cohort. So um, we have, um, uh, for example, the data science for, um, sorry, the Portuguese Data Science Association, which we've created now. We launched, just launched a couple of weeks ago. So if you go to that link, you'll be able to sign up for those of you that are interested in sort of being part of it in various ways, either as uh, enthusiasts uh, encouraging us to do more of this work or more involved and actually do uh, data science. Um, and then you'll join a, a cohort of uh, fellows that uh, by now uh, numbers over 200 uh, people that have gone through this program um, dedica in a dedicated fashion, so three months full time, and many other people that um, are part of this community already. Um, I think we have over 20,000 Twitter followers at the moment. Uh, we've got a, a pretty big uh, Facebook community. We've got a few thousand people that come to the conferences that we organize uh, in various parts of the world. So this is a community that, uh, that over time has, has grown. And, and you know, we want to uh, point that out because we think the best way to do this kind of work is through collaboration. So what we can do is facilitate the community and we hope that you guys can then uh, talk to each other and do more of this kind of work. And one of the ways that we want to make that easy for, for you and, and other people out there is through a platform that's also quite new, uh, which is uh, uh, Solve, Solve for Good. Uh, again, you can uh, see the hyperlink below. Um, with the idea that we'll be able to uh, post problems that are the, some of the partner organizations that uh, we unfortunately don't have enough capacity to work with and some of the fellows that we applied, you saw 4,300 people that applied that we unfortunately weren't able to accept. Many of them were, were definitely good enough that can then come together through this platform and work on problems that matter. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. And I'll thank you, Paul. Very good. We'll have, we'll have a quick chat among, uh, between the four of us and then we'll pass it on to John and Sa. I'd just like to make maybe my own remarks on, on all this and uh, thank you for inspiring us on all the things that we can do with data. But at the same time, I think also uh, it's important to understand uh, all the other things. And you mentioned nudging and using people, bring it to happiness. but. All those tools in the wrong hands can almost be weapons of mass destruction. And so I think it's interesting to actually think of what are, what are the challenges also that sort of starting to live with data is going to bring to us. And I, I, I think there, there are several layers here of what, what this will mean to humans. And I think the first one is, is the one I just mentioned. Owning the data is going to be a huge responsibility. And so the real question is, what do we expect from governments or from Facebooks or from Mark Zuckerbergs or from anywhere, anyone in the world that is going to have access to all of this? And how can we actually, as human beings, start sort of legislating or changing behavior or coming up with codes of conduct that are going to make us use this as a force for social good? Because remember, in the end, we're here talking about social good, but everything has to be about social good. In the end, if it's not about people, and what is it about? If you're in a, you make the presentation, you're in a company, you're transforming your company, who are you transforming your organization for? It's about people. Right? And so everything in data, in the potential for data, and the potential for data science to bring tremendous value and to help solve so many of human problems, including, including the road to happiness, the most difficult one, the one that has taken philosophers thousands of years to think about, and here we are now using data and going at a, a, an incredible pace, the, the potential is huge, and the potential to create social good, to solve social problems, the ones that Paul just mentioned is amazing. But then there's all the stuff that we have to be worried about. Who is going to own this data? Who is going to be responsible for it? Who is going to protect it? And I think that's just one layer of the issue that we have to be concerned about. There's another layer, which is, if all these things are going to be done by machines, what are we, as human beings, going to do? And many people say, oh, no, it's just a matter of giving education. It's not just a matter of giving education. There's a study that I love to mention, and this is not about data science. This is about lawyers. Data science and law? Absolutely. So there's a study that was done at Columbia with my alma mater. And, and basically, they actually tested um, lawyers and AI engines on finding out uh, loopholes 
in non-disclosure agreements. I hope you all know what this is. Basically, you have a non-disclosure agreement written by lawyers, and they basically try to figure out either there's a loophole, there's a, there's a problem in it. All right, so they had an AI and a lawyer following it. And the AI caught, I think it was 95%, I'm doing it by, the AI caught, the AI, the artificial intelligence caught 95% of the loopholes. The human being caught 88% of the loopholes. Not so bad. 95, 88, it's almost there. The problem is that the AI took 20 seconds and the person took almost 30 hours to do this. That is a difference. So what jobs are gonna be around? Right? This is the other thing that we have to be worried about. At the, and it's not just the fact that AI and data is coming, it's the speed at which it is coming. This is the amazing thing. I mean, if you were here in this amphitheater talking about AI five years from now, we wouldn't even be having this conversation. The conversation that we, that we are having today would have seemed science fiction five years ago. Imagine what this will be five years from now, because we know that this is exponential. We know that, it's, I mean, someone is making this example of how you fold, we know that the speed will, is likely to increase. So how is our society, our, all the people that are acquiring jobs, I like to tell my students, everything that you learn will be useless in five years. Even programming is gonna be useless in five or six years. Right? Because machines are gonna start programming themselves. So how are we as, as a society gonna deal, you know, we are human beings, we hate change. We like comfort. How are we going to deal with the amount of stress that's coming? How, how do we prepare our kids? And it's not just our kids, ourselves, because this is going to be in our lifetime, in our working lifetime, that all this change is going to come. How do we prepare ourselves for that? And this is another element. And this is about society and how are we going to take people from place A to place B. But it's also about our individuals. So the, other, the last point I'd like to mention beyond the, the, the responsibility of owning the data, governments, companies, mm -hmm. Facebooks, beyond the responsibility of dealing with the change from a societal perspective, the most amazing thing is how we're going to deal with the change individually. Mm -hmm. How we, as individuals, are going to be living in this age where so much is known about us, so much of what we do is going to be replaced. The potential for abundance is huge because so many of the problems are, the problems are going to be solved. And I'd like to actually think of how I, as a dean of a business school, think about this, just to make two points. First is, which is the big issue of the skills of the future. What are these skills of the future? How do we train our students? How do we train our kids? I mean, many of you are parents. What do you tell your kids that are now 9, 10, 12 years old as they prepare for the future? And I'd like to make two points. First, about data, and second, about more generally about technology. The point about data is we're not all going to be programmers. So if the plan is to actually take all your kids and put them behind a computer and learn, teach them to crunch, I think this is, we were talking about geeks, is gonna be a very geeky society. And we don't have to do this. But we are gonna to have to train translators for sure. And I think the real challenge for us in our schools, both in economics and management, also if for those of you that are studying politi doing political science or psychology, and Louise just mentioned it, it's about translating. It's about how do you actually think of data understand it, and then use it. Not program it, but use data, use algorithms, use AI to solve real problems. And now we come back to the social good. We come back to happiness, we come back to phishing, we come back to all this stuff, right? Because Paul can actually use data to solve illegal phishing, not because he's a programmer, but because he can think about the problem and our information and data can help him think that problem. So I think the challenge for each one of us, and we are talking about each one of our organizations, each one of our companies, each one of our jobs, is really to become a translator. How do you actually understand the, the, the difference that data is going to have on your job? And how you can actually learn to make that translation between the data, the algorithms, and the job that you do, and the company that you work for. And in the end of all this, when more and more the machines end up solving our problems, there's going to be the real, perp the real problem that I'm going to come, that I'd like to come. What do we do? And again, this is about 10, 15 years from now. This is not science fiction. What do we do? And I think the real job for human beings, and I think the real job we should be preparing for us for, is to be explorers. I think the only thing that machines will never do is to explore, is to put questions, is to raise questions, not to solve problems. Machines are going to be the problem solvers. 
We're going to be the problem creators. And what I really think, and I, I, maybe I'll throw this question back to Louise, which is sort of how do, looking at from a point of, of human beings, when you have all this, when people know so much about you, what is it that we are going to do, and how do we find purpose and happiness in a world where machines are going to be doing most of the stuff that we used to doing? Well, and I'll throw the question back as well. Um, so we have ethical issues, privacy issues, but my bigger question is, just because we can, should we? Um, exactly. That's a <laughs> so if we think about, do, do, we, do we all want easy, lovely, simple, pleasant lives? Like on the surface, we say, yeah, that'd be great, but think about how bored we'd be. So what actually gives flavor to life is those days that are miserable, that are difficult. We put a lot of effort. Um, things that are hard, where we fail, we take risks, and we drop to the bottom, but that actually makes life worthwhile, and that's also how we grow as humans. So if we remove all of that and make people's lives pleasant and too happy, what does that mean for the human condition? Will we become miserable because we're too happy? Yeah, maybe, maybe to add uh, to the questions about, uh, about who owns the data, what are the opportunities for us? What's the role of humans? I think a couple of things which, um, which uh, in, what I've discovered by doing these kinds of things are very different than what the media and the headlines will say. First of all, yes, there's more data out there than ever. But it turns out we're not collecting the right data to do social good. To give you an example, coming, about, coming back to phishing. So we discovered through this process by working with two of the largest uh, satellite image providers uh, in the world that all of their data, or 99% of it, was being collected over land. And they call this opportunistic collection. So we're talking to their, uh, the, the board there, and they said, yeah, we, we turn the satellites off when they go over the ocean because nobody's going to pay for that data. And so we had a conversation through this project uh, that then led them to start collecting data over the oceans to uh, more frequently identify what is happening over the oceans. So that's a good example of you don't, you, yeah, we have tons of data, but it's not the right data to, do the, to work on the problems that we care about. That's one. The right info. Exactly. And, uh, and this happens frequently. I mean, education, if you think about trying to predict which uh, people uh, in high schools or college are going to be dropping out, it's very, very hard to find good data to be able to use data science to solve that, that mm -hmm. problem. Um, the second piece is uh, that we as a data science community are awfully prepared for uh, some of the difficult questions that you're asking. So we don't have a good uh, a def definition of vocabulary of what we mean when we talk about certain things. How do we deal with ethics? And we spend a lot of time on ethics in the program, in the summer fellowship, through our, the training that we do. Uh, but a data scientist is, uh, you know, is analyzing data from people that they might not want to be analyzed the data. They, they might get predicted uh, as a false positive or false negative. Uh, how do we deal with that? What are the rules of engagement that we want to uh, adhere to as data scientists? And to be honest, uh, it's an open question, and so anybody can do anything. And there's lots of examples where this is happening in a very, very bad way. Uh, uh, and we, we try to set an example of how we think it should be done, but there's many of them which you might have heard about where that's not the case. Um, and then to the role of uh, what humans are going to be doing, I mean, Andrew Eng, who is one of the you know, uh, founders of, of the field of AI, he always has his rule of thumb that's, that says, well, anything that takes a human under one second to do, that's something that a machine can do uh, already today. I mean, and that, that one second will probably go to two seconds, to five, and you know, in 10, 15 years, the conversation will be different. Um, and I think then the, the, the roles of the, of, of the humans, of us humans, <laughs> sounds a little weird, uh, but of us as, as a community is to say, uh, what are the values that we want to, uh, we work with when we do this kind of uh, thing? What are the ethics? What are the limitations? When do we use what kind of data? And I think if we don't get that right, um, the percentage of what the human versus the AI does, that's gonna, we're going to feel the, 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 the effect of that uh, more and more. So. Um, I, is it? Is it on? Yeah. Um, one of the things that I keep thinking when I heard, for example, yesterday, the, the panel of the mayors, I don't know if you've been here in the audience, but for example, about human sustainability or smart cities. Before smart cities, we, we need smart citizens. And for that to happen, we need education, so we need the best practices of private, so the private sector, so companies, uh, universities, education, and we need uh, the nonprofit, the all sectors working together. And 
asking the right questions to have the right info. Just, just one specific case that we are working on. Guys, in Portugal, we are spending half a million per day with inmates in, in jails. And we are not empowering them. So we are not doing the right question. We are not empowering inmates and we are spending money. So we are not investing, we are spending. You're not, I think this data science for social good is asking the right questions, having the right info to solve humankind's problem. And this is, a, this is a huge opportunity that I don't have the answer for you, Danielle, but I would like to ask, for example, the audience, which questions do you have about the subject? Because honestly, uh, we've been here almost one hour and I think there are a lot of beautiful cases that Paul could bring as well because they are working with predicting long-term unemployment in Portugal. That's huge. We can predict burnout in companies, for example, but what you audience, smart citizens in this room can ask to us, not to me and Danielle maybe, but to these amazing speakers and to all of you, which question do you have about it? Please, audience, questions, because normally Portuguese don't do questions, so bring it on. Surprises. Hands on. Yay. I'm seeing already. <laughs> Hello, I am Portuguese and I have a lot of questions <laughs> good, good. about good. it. <laughs> so, I saw data science like a hammer and technology like a hammer used by smart people to solve all the problems in the world. So, I have a question about human emotions and human brain, because I think it's the most powerful algorithm, and I think it's the, the solution for the gap between technology and humans. So my question is how we can be happy and predictive like a human being also be able to use the technology as something simple, like um, a kid doing a code for a problem in, uh, in, in the school, or uh, older people do using for learn something new. How can we improve that in real lifetime? Louise, so this one is for you. I, I, so I used to think one of the frontiers that AI will never be able to tackle is human emotion, and I now think differently. I think there will be nothing AI can't do, and that is a good thing, it's also a bad thing. But, um, so we've done a couple, not we, but in psychology, a couple of studies looking at um, c can we use AI machines, I guess, to become therapists, because we used to think our jobs were safe, right? We've got the monopoly on human emotion, and it turns out they're just as good as us. <laughs> so what that means is that, you know, you're asking how can we be happy? I think over time we're gonna see, everybody's gonna be stuck to their phone, and that will be your best friend, literally. So AI will understand your emotions, will be able to respond to you with empathy, will be able to give you suggestions that fit you, kind of like personalized medicine. Um, will be able to suggest, because they will know your network, you know this person, you know, they're free at the moment, because of course they will have the phone as well, or whatever device. I, I, think, I think we will get to that point where it will become much easier to be happy, um, but then we're still stuck with the human problem of having to regulate our own emotions but I think that will become easier for us because now we tend to suffer alone in silence at Starbucks, scrolling phone, <laughs> and nothing's coming back. So I think that's where AI will be helpful. Something will come back. Um, and that will be kind of a personal guide, a therapist, if you will, to help us through life. I don't know if that answers your question. But, but, but still human control the, the uh, artificial intelligence? This is the question. Who is behind that? Well, and who's behind that is 
all of us and him and I, I don't have the answer to that question, but uh, I think yes, it can be in good hands and bad hands. I, I don't know how to, I, that's, a, that's a question nobody really knows. I, I think that, that is exactly the risk because in the end there will be, I mean, to a large extent there's a question of whether they'll be conscious. Uh, we don't know, we don't understand consciousness. Mm -hmm. but, but the real issue behind this, behind the machine that actually sees you scrolling and gives you an answer, there's some guy that has programmed and that's created the machine that is running it. And that's real danger. I mean, that's real, that, that, that's the, the big Leviathan danger. But I, I do think that in the end, um, people to people contact will matter. I think we are fundamentally social beings. I mean, I know we have a machine in our brain, so we don't have anything more than a machine. And so uh, we're going to be able to plug stuff and, and produce electric current that's going to affect our happiness. But I think in the end, what is the point of that? I mean, there's also this issue. I mean, when you think about it, is okay, you develop all these algorithms, but there's a point, okay, detecting illegal phishing matters. Uh, all this stuff matters. But in the end, if you want to be with other people, it's, it's going to be for free. Why, what is the point of replacing you with a machine, right? And so I think in the end, what, what we're going to be left doing is really this is our emotions, but not just our emotions when we're depressed and we're alone, because that help can matter, but our emotions when we are with other people. Those are going to be replaceable, and that's one. Of, so, being humans is really what's going to make us competitive. In the end. Maybe one thing to add about how we look at this, because it's uh, you know the, maybe I've done a bad job at explaining uh, how much uh, how how little magic there's behind this, right? This is not a magic toolbox where we do things and it's a, you know a couple of whisk kids that have magic powers that then come up with this. Uh, it is. Uh, things that we understand, uh, it's in the end basic statistics, we have some help with some new data and some computing power, but it's not uh, this evil force that's going to replace our brain. Um, I would look at it more as, instead of replace, say, how does it complement what we do? And a lot of the use cases that we see where the real value can be done also in, in, in social good uh, is when the two, uh, the machine and the human, the expert, get brought together. There's tons of examples. I mean, in radiology, they had this example where the, the, uh, the, the artificial intelligence, the algorithm, could detect uh, malignant uh, cancers or malignant uh, tissue uh, mm -hmm. with a certain rate, 95%, I think. And the human, the doctors, the radiologists could do it with 90%. But it turns out that they're also very different in the types of uh, mistakes that they make and the types of images that they can detect well. And when you put them together, when you tell the radiologist, hey, this is one of those cases where uh, you probably need to take, pay good, uh, attention because the, the machine flagged something, can you validate it? That's when the joint accuracy of detecting malignant tissue goes up to 98%. And, uh, and, and there's a famous case of, uh, of I think it's Moneyball, the, 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 this, 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 thing, this algorithm that could help baseball scouts detect the next prodigies in baseball. And it was always, it was Moneyball going to replace these scouts? And the answer in the end, uh, is a famous book by Nate Silver that tells that whole story, is the best results is when you put the scouts, the humans, together with the algorithm. And that's when you can find the best baseball players. And I think we're still at, this, at the stage, and we will be for, for some time, uh, where the two of them together can help us do a lot of the social good that we aspire to do much better than if we always try to talk about, is it the machine or is it the human? Hello, my name is Frederick. Um, I come from Green Tech Challenge and we work with connecting green startups and green innovation to investors and clients. We have right now mapped around 40% of the green uh, SMBs in Europe. So it's quite a lot. We have a lot of data. We don't know how to handle it. Um, the question I want to pose to you guys is that in, in this world we have a lot of problems. We have an entity called the UN. The UN has estimated that to reach the sustainable development goals, we need to invest further 12 trillion US dollars. That's a lot of dollars. Um, so my question to you guys is, how can data science help approach this? We, I, I think this is the most important problem that we have ever faced as a species. How can data science help us find these 12 trillion dollars per year up until 2030? Thank you. Yeah. I, I, can, I can try and, and, and give you my view on that. I think uh, there's, there's many elements that we probably need to do to solve this uh, issue and to, to meet the goals. Um, yeah. Data science 
has a very specific role, uh, at least that, that we've demonstrated in many of these cases, that it can uh, help spend existing resources better. So if we talk about the environment, uh, we worked with the Environmental Protection Agency uh, from the United States government. It's a federal agency. They do lots of stuff. And one of the things they do is they go out to facilities, about 150,000 facilities, which are you know, factories, uh, some kind of you know, production sites that handle waste. And they need to make sure that this waste gets transported from the source through the transporter to the sink in an uh, environmentally friendly way. And they enforce this. So they've got about uh, 200 inspectors. Uh, and these inspectors per, in a specific area. We worked in New York City. And these inspectors have limited time. And they had a hit rate of 40% with the current way of working. And, uh, but they could only inspect a couple of thousand sites a year, not all of them, far from all of them. And definitely on all of the different uh, details of the, the types of materials and waste. And so what we helped them is said, okay, listen, you have uh, 200 inspectors, you can inspe uh, inspect a few thousand facilities. Which ones do you want to go to? To make sure that the hit rate you have is higher. And what happened there is that then they were able to use this inspector pool to, do, to almost double the hit rate to around 70% to make sure that they were enforcing more effectively. No extra dollar was required there, right? So you basically get a bigger bang for your buck in this case. And I think that's probably in many of these areas in the social development goals where I could imagine that data science could have that kind of effect and maybe that the 12 trillion required could be uh, uh, either it would be less, so you, the requirement would be less. Or if you have 12 trillion, you can use them to do even more, uh, uh, to be more ambitious than what you want to achieve. I, I, I just like, I think if, if we go beyond data science, if you think of technology in general, I think a lot of the solutions are going to come from the exponential speed at which technology is going to develop. I mean, we're talking about, about data, but if you bring solar into this, I mean, the way solar is going to transform the production of energy, it's going to make coal is already going to be out of business in no time and many other so elements of polluting technology is going to be out of business in no time because solar is going to take over. So I think technology, because of the speed, because it's going to gain speed, and I mean, we were just looking at the presentation before, you look at more data coming online, more networks coming online, more computing power coming online. This is going to be a loop that feeds on itself, and this will generate growth that will accelerate. And so to a large extent, that acceleration of technology in data, in solar, in blockchain, in quantum computing, in all these dimensions, I think will actually end up solving many of our problems. The challenge for us is, how do you make sure that that technology, which is just a hammer, we were talking about a hammer, which is just a hammer, how do we make sure that the person who holds that hammer is using it to do the right thing about it? Right? So the problem is not technological. That's going to come. The problem is not even solving the problem. The problem is building our institutions here, on land, across countries, across regions, across companies, in ways that can actually make sure that that hammer is hitting the right nails and not just destroying, destroying the board. That, I think, is a real challenge. And that, that I think, is the stuff that needs a lot of discussion. We're being flashed. Just one more? Last question. If there's Just any. One more question? If there's any. If there's not, any? then we'll go for break. No? There's one right there, or yeah, one right here. Then we'll see. Uh, hello, I'm George, a Portuguese student, and we've been hearing for a whole hour about all the good aspects of, the, of AI, but how about the negative effects of AI? Because all throughout history, uh, new innovations in technologies, with the appearance of new innovation in technologies, people fear that they will be replaced by it, and how can I, as a student, do to not be replaced by the AI? Woo. <laughs> That's very good. You want to take that up? Yeah. So. Uh, Go work with him. Um, I think. Uh, let me start with the first part of the question, which is, what's the negative side, right? I think there's lots of risk associated with this work, and um, there's many examples where people are using, uh, let's say, AI or algorithms, for example, to do. Uh, bill, uh, bill assignments in the United States when you go to court and you know you're in. And in, in the trial, in the process of trial, uh, you get assigned bail or not, and whether you have to, you get to stay in jail for a certain amount of time, or you get to be free. 
depending on the risk of, uh, of doing things while you're out there and waiting for the judgment. There's algorithms being used for this, and we know that they are uh, uh, obviously making mistakes like any algorithm any human also would make. But the way that these are set up at the moment don't allow for uh, any, there's no transparency, nobody can challenge these algorithms, nobody has uh, explained how they work, uh, and so they're having adverse effects. And there's lots of examples where you see that people think the algorithm is the all-knowing being that can get it right all the time, and that's definitely not the case. And that comes back to my earlier point, we need to define uh, what we as data scientists, as a community, find acceptable uh, for uh, basically implementing and using this technology. And I think this comes then to your second part of the question, what can I do as a student? I think it's important to, one, uh, become familiar with it, what, what AI can and cannot do. And uh, that's kind of the translator role that, uh, that, that Daniel uh, was, was pointing out, and having an awareness of the basics. Um, second piece is, uh, you know, help think us through what the framework should be. I mean, well, how do we uh, define what data can be shared when and where. I mean, we have new regulations, GDPR, coming into force uh, a couple of months ago. We don't really know what it means. I mean, it could be lot, very good, right? And uh, through other ways, we're talking to the EU commissioners and listening to what they think about this. Um, in many ways, it could stifle innovation in data science. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it could protect our privacy. Uh, but we need people, smart minds like yourself, uh, to help us test what we find acceptable as a society. Um, and, uh, and we hope that you can help us with that, so. Can I, you, I mean, you're too young to know a show uh, that when I think some of the people here are my age, a long time ago was uh, called Star Trek. They had Captain Kirk and Admiral Spock <laughs> leading the enterprise, one known world. I think that's gonna be our job. I think it's about exploring, it's about using all the potential that the machines have to do this for us. But remember that the explorers, the guys driving the enterprise, is us. And sort of making sure that we keep that skill of not just sitting in our couch, not just sitting, up, not just sitting on Starbucks, scrolling through your, your mobile phone and looking for cool music to play and looking at cat videos on YouTube. Uh, because that's a big waste of time. But actually preserving the spirit that all that allows you but to be... But it doesn't make you happy. And it doesn't, it, <laughs> But, that's, but that is exactly the point. But that is exactly the point. And that, is the, and that I think is the <laughs> fundamental difference. And I, if I come to Louise's point, is the difference between, you mentioned, I don't know the word, hedonic and eudaimonic. And eudaimonic happiness. And I think the difference for us and what AI can do is whether you're going to be the guy from eudonic happiness or eudaimonic. What's the word? Eudonic. Eudonic versus eudaimonic. eudaimonic. <laughs> and I think the one thing that's going to give you a job if, if, if you focus on your eudaimonic happiness. And that means that even if cat videos make you happy, you know that what really brings value is when you work, when you're hard, when you explore, when you conquer new worlds, when you actually, coming back to what we're doing, when you create social impact. And it's that sense of finding comfort in the difference you make that will forever separate you from machines, and that's the one thing that will keep your job for a long time. Can I just add something? I don't know if you've seen a movie that a guy just created an algorithm to find his love of his life. And the algorithm found a girl. So between the girl A and the girl B, the algorithms showed, OK, you, should, you really should marry the girl A. And in the end of the movie, so this movie, in the end, he went with the girl B. So he fell for the girl B. I think there are things that machines cannot, at least I want to believe in that, <laughs> cannot replace. And one of the things is falling in love, critical thinking, empathy. I want to believe in that. I really want to believe in that. And at least asking the right questions. So thank you for everything. Thank, thank you. you.